Happy Easter from the Davis family. We miss you guys so much. We cannot wait to be together again. We love you. Virtual, Virtual hugs. hugs! Hello, church family. We love, we miss you. We thank you for all your prayers, and we hope to see you soon. We miss everybody. And we wish you all a very blessed Easter. Easter. Love you. See you soon. Bye-bye. It's the Bridger Brothers, and we hope y'all are doing well today. We miss you guys, and we're looking forward to seeing y'all soon. God bless, and have a good rest. Welcome from the Kellys. As we celebrate this Easter, we're so thankful that we have a risen Savior and that he came for us. God bless you. We love you. Happy Easter. Happy, Happy Easter. Easter. Hi. Happy, Happy Resurrection, Resurrection Sunday. Sunday. We love and miss you guys. Hello, FAC family. Happy Resurrection Day. Good morning, church family. We love and miss you. Love and miss you. Bye. Bye. Church family, we miss you very much and wish you a very happy Easter. Hi, everyone. I hope you have a good Easter and enjoy the day. And I just wish I could hear Lillian sing. Hi, FAC family. We really miss you. We miss being with you guys. I miss Kingdom Kids tremendously. I really hope we'll get to be in the church real soon one day. And I just want to wish you guys a very happy Easter. Happy Easter, everybody. We are excited to worship today and celebrate a risen Savior. So I pray that you would just raise your hands, lift up your voice with us, and let's sing together and worship the King.
we glorify your name, Lord. Hallelujah.
fears are gone. Welcome to First Apostolic Church. Happy Easter to everyone. This is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. We celebrate the greatest thing that's ever taken place in human history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ that gives hope to everybody. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. Before we get into the Word of the Lord this morning, I uh, want to go through sort of our standard announcements, remind you that our regularly scheduled service is every Sunday morning at 10 a.m., prayer at 9.30 Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m., prayer at 7 o'clock. Monday, our youth department, Breakpoint Youth, will be having uh, their service. And on Thursday night, they have uh, tribes that are small groups on Thursday night. Every night at 5 o'clock, prayer requests will go out that have been submitted to the church uh, from our body. That uh, request, if you need one to go out because of your sickness, someone in your family, you can do so by sending it to info. Email info at facaurora.org, info at facaurora.org, and you can submit those per request. And uh, we hope that you'll continue to join us with our scheduled services. Whether this is your first time, if it is, we welcome you, or you're a longtime member, we'll continue this schedule as long as the stay-at-home order is in effect. We do want to be praying for our nation. 
We would so much love for this virus to continue to decline in Illinois and other places where we are hearing that it has taken a turn uh, and is declining somewhat. And uh, so we wanna to continue to pray that that would happen where we are either able to gather together at our campus in 1690 Sheffer Road in Aurora, Illinois, Sheffer at McClure Roads. We hope that you will be able to join us when we are able to do so. Also, as far as giving, online giving can take place where we can worship the Lord in our tithes and offerings. You can go to facaurora.org and there is a Give Now tab that you can click and you are able to give so digitally or through the Breeze app for those who are members and have a profile and are already registered with Breeze. We have had several that have contacted us over the last week or so now that the stay-at-home order has gone past a couple weeks and into this next month asking about sending checks, preferring to send checks whether than digital giving. We understand that not everybody wants to give digitally and that is perfectly fine. Our P.O. Box is the best place to send that to. P.O. Box 1582, P.O. Box 1582, Aurora, Illinois. And the zip code is different from some. Uh, Aurora has several zip codes. It is 60507. That's 15 P.O. Box 1582, Aurora, Illinois, 60507, and you can send your, your gifts there, your tithes and offerings. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started today. We want to pray and uh, for the needs that are continuing to be present. We want to pray for our president, our government, uh, our Congress, uh, the, the different task force who are serving uh, with the, the COVID-19 crisis, the pandemic. We want to pray for all them. We want to pray for our governor, our state, our mayors, uh, our law enforcement, our first responders, our healthcare workers, our hospitals, everyone, our scientists who are playing a role in fighting this, uh, this virus that has uh, attacked the United States and, and, of course, the world. We want to pray for all of them that the Lord would give them strength. We want to continue to pray for those in the hospital. At this particular time, our, our prayer requests, we have five that continue to be in the hospital. Three are intubated. We want to remember Elsie Buford. We want to remember Myla and Omar Bijek. That the Lord would touch these uh, critical needs. We want to see them come off those ventilators, being able to breathe on their own, gain their strength back, and to, to return home. Also remember Brother Owen Davis's mother and father. Brother Owen's uh, mother was in the hospital with pneumonia in both lungs. I know his father was being tested too. So let's continue to remember uh, his parents in prayer. And then we want to celebrate. Brother Roger Kittner has come home. We've been praying for that for some time. And while he is still on oxygen, he is at home. And Brother Roger, Sister Helen Kittner, wonderful people at First Apostolic Church. I know that Sister Kittner is glad to have Brother Kittner home. And then Brother Tim Sitar, he is no longer in ICU, no longer innovated, no longer in ICU. He's in a regular room. We love Brother Sitar at First Apostolic Church. We want him just to continue to gain his strength back, along with a, a list, a long list of those who have been sick, been hospitalized, some have been intubated. We are thankful that God is doing good things here at First Apostolic Church. We have a ways to go. We understand that. But let's continue to pray for all of these needs. And so before we go into the word of the Lord, let's pray for these needs. And then let's pray for our time together that the Lord would just be with us as we open his word today. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to come and make our petitions known, to cast our cares upon you because you care for us. What a wonderful day to be able to do so as we, we celebrate the greatest uh, uh, thing that has taken place in human history the resurrection, the overcoming of death, hell, and the grave. Lord, what a comfort and strength and hope this day is for us. And so as we bring our needs to you today, we do so with hope. We do so with praise and thanksgiving for what you have already done. And God, we're believing what you're going to continue to do for those who are hospitalized and, and those who are homesick still, maybe wrestling and recovering. We pray that you would continue to work and move throughout the First Apostolic Church community and family. And then beyond that, to the world, Lord, our, our president, our mayor, our governor, uh, the task force, our first responders, our, all of our healthcare workers and hospitals. God, we just pray that you would strengthen them, give them wisdom, Lord, that you would uphold them with your spirit and help them to lead us through this crisis, that we can return to normal and gathering together. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Uh, one other thing I want to talk to you about is Sister Laura Darby. Sister Laura Darby has gone home, but it's not just home uh, 
uh, as maybe we've been talking about recently going home from the hospital, Sister Laura Darby has gone home to be with the Lord. And uh, this uh, Sister Darby, and, and I can't really say Sister Darby without Brother Darby as well, Brother Ralph Darby, Brother and Sister Darby, just part of the culture of First Apostolic Church, elders, faithful throughout the years, and we want to be in prayer for the Darby family as they are grieving the loss of Sister Darby while we celebrate her life and are so thankful that she has gone on to be with the Lord and that there was not suffering and so many things that could have happened. We, we celebrate that. There's also a sense of loss as a faithful saint of God has gone to be with the Lord. And, and today, um, I, I don't know that I've ever dedicated a, a message that I've spoken uh, that I can think of off the top of my head, but I, I thought today as uh, we're not able to have a, a funeral and a homegoing service like we would traditionally have, and we look forward to possibly having a memorial service in the future when we can gather back together. With, with her passing this week and uh, sort of the helplessness of not being able to do what we want to do to honor such a, a legacy and a great life, I do want to take this uh, message and dedicate it to the Darbys on behalf of Sister Laura Darby, and to uh, maybe this is my way of being able to preach a memorial service before the memorial service or to preach a funeral the week that someone has gone to be with the Lord, a, a wonderful elder. And so today, as we go into the word of the Lord, it, it's somewhat surreal today. Today is the first Sunday in the, the more than 240 year history of the United States of America that ch Christian church buildings have been closed. That, that means that uh, during world wars and other pandemics of the past, this has never happened, what's happening today, that churches in North America would be closed on Easter Sunday. So while we live in the 21st century and we are once again reminded how radically things can change over a few days, a few weeks, and even a few months, the advances that we have seen in, in technology cannot stop humanity from facing novel challenges. The church has always had to adapt, going back to its origination, it's always had to adapt. Thankfully, technology has made it easier for us to adapt. During the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, only 35% of households had telephones. And when I say telephone, I'm not talking about uh, a cell phone, a mobile phone that we all have. I'm talking about a home phone, a hardwired line. Believe it or not, uh, young people, children, there used to be in every home a phone that was all mounted on the wall or sat on a table, and there was a line that ran to it to what we call telephone poles. And we were all connected with, by, by hardwired lines. And in 1918, when the Spanish flu took place, only 35% of households even had those type of, of phones. And so video technology, the internet, uh, the manner in which we are interconnected in 2020 would have been considered science fiction in, in 1918. And so I am thankful for the technology that we have, that we've been able to adapt to remain connected, that we have been able today to reach up in prayer and praise, and now we can be able to hear from the Word of God, which is the power to change us and transform us, which brings faith by its hearing. Last week I introduced our theme for this year's Easter campaign, the theme of taking up my cross. It's in alignment with our vision for the next few years, which is found in Ezekiel's vision, Ezekiel 37, of the Valley of Dry Bones, how the Lord took a valley of dry bones and he brought those bones together. He put sinew and muscle and flesh. The breath of life went into them. They became a mighty army uh, that was brought out of that Valley of Dry Bones. Of course, we've sort of been making the connection to, we live in the Fox Valley here in Aurora, Illinois. And we believe that God wants to take this valley and he wants to bring a mighty army of, uh, out of the scattered bones that are in the Fox Valley, figuratively, metaphorically. And so as a result of our desire to see God create a mighty army out of the Valley of Dry Bones, we have a yearly theme this year of let it start with me. Before God moves on uh, others outside the church, we talked about it has to start with us. We have to make sure that we are living and healthy, that we allow God to, to form us and shape us and empower us to be his soldiers in the kingdom as he would start that mighty army with us who have that passion, that desire, who he's given that vision to. So let it start with me. 
it begins with an individual person. It begins on an individual level. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We want the will of God. We want transformation. And so even today, as we dig into the Word of God, we are transformed as the Word of God renews our mind. And Jesus taught that discipleship begins on an individual journey. And that is Mark, the 8th chapter, verse 34, sort of the theme for our Easter campaign. When he had called people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Specifically, our theme for this Easter campaign is taking up my cross. In the same sense as we are personalizing the Valley of Dry Bones and saying, God, let it start with me. We're personalizing many of our traditional services and celebrations throughout this year. Easter, uh, the one that we are celebrating right now, we're making it personal in the same vein of that theme. Uh, let it start with me. Let, let me take up my cross as I begin to follow you. Specifically, taking up the cross that Jesus was referencing was uh, about surrendering our life and dying out to our will and our way for the kingdom. Notice he called the people to himself with his disciples also. Jesus emphasized that this call is one that is universal, that every one of us, whoever wants to follow him, must deny themselves and take up their cross. And so we want to be followers of Jesus Christ. We want to be disciples of Jesus Christ. We are the ones that are saying, Lord, I personally, I want to take up my cross. I want to follow you. I want to be your disciple. And the cross is not about, um, it's not about decor, it's not about art, it's not about hanging something on the wall from the rearview mirror of a car. The cross is about self-denial. It was an instrument of execution, of death. Uh, it would be equivalent maybe to an electric chair in our day and time. And typically we don't hang electric chairs on the wall or from the rearview mirror of our car. In fact, we might be a little concerned about somebody who would do something like that. The reason is, is, is the symbolism, it, what it represents, execution. And this is not something that we glorify in, or that we celebrate. Yet the cross in, in the first century was a, a similar instrument. And when Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, this was not a glorious thing in that sense. It was a call for us to surrender and for us to die. We're to follow him as he climbs the hill and stretches himself out on the cross and is crucified and put to death. We're not to be detached observers. We are to be participants in the death of Jesus Christ. Paul, he, he valued the kingdom of God and a relationship with Jesus Christ to such a degree that he, he valued it above everything else. And really that's what worship is about, worth Ship. How worth, what value do you place on the kingdom of God and relationship of God? How do you worship him? Paul worshiped him with everything. Philippians 3 and 8, Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, from whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, as trash, that I may gain Christ. Notice what the apostle is saying. Deny myself, take up my cross, the apostle is saying, yes, I gladly, I, I want to take up my cross because I count everything as garbage uh, when it comes to, to comparing that with knowing Jesus Christ. I hope that everyone on the uh, other side of my voice, uh, other side of my voice today, that that would be your heart's desire to say, to know Jesus Christ, to be a part of the kingdom of God, I value that more than anything in this world. And when you value that more than anything in this world, then you are worshiping God as the highest thing of your worship, the highest object of your worship, that you are seeking first his kingdom and believing God will take care of everything else. And so that's, that's what we talked about on, on Palm Sunday, last Sunday. And, and then, of course, Friday night, the devotion. I, I talked about Bad Friday. Uh, we call it Good Friday. But when you talk about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, how they mocked him and scourged him, how they put a crown of thorns upon his head, how they flogged him, they beat him. Uh, medical expert Davis says, a physician says that, that when you flogged somebody, the, the brutal beating left every recipient on the edge of death itself. 
One witness to a Roman flogging said that the sufferer's veins are laid bare, that their muscles, tendons, and bowels are laid open to exposure. This, this was the most horrific type of uh, punishment that you can imagine. We, we can't create movies that would adequately describe and portray what flogging would have been like in the first century. Not only that, he was nailed to an old rugged cross that we sing about. So painful was death by crucifixion that a new word was coined to describe it, and, and that's the word excruciating. It's a Latin word that means out of the cross. When, when you have to come up with a word to describe the pain of something, because no other words will do so, it lets you know how bad it was. And to die by crucifixion was to go to the lowest depths. Crucifixion was so degrading that Roman citizens were exempt from the statute. It was reserved for criminals and slaves and the lower parts of society. And, and so when you look at what crucifixion is all about, you have to ask, how? How can we call this good? And, <coughs> excuse me. How can we call this good? Should we call this Good Friday? To get a glimpse of what the perspective was in the first century, Luke records about uh, some individuals on a road to Emmaus. And when Jesus comes to them, this is what Jesus says. What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? In fact, if you were to, to look at these followers of Jesus, you wouldn't call it Good Friday. You'd call it Sad Friday. They were sad. The reason they were sad, they explained. It, it was because of Jesus. They were sad because of all the things that happened. They were sad because of Jesus of Nazareth, how he had been delivered up and condemned to death and that he had been crucified. And it was a, a sad day. However, what changed everything and made Sad Friday or Bad Friday Good Friday is when they received a illumination, a revelation, that Jesus was no longer in the grave, but that he was alive. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what we celebrate today on Easter Sunday, changes everything. It changes our perspective on the cross. It changes our perspective on the, the scourging and the flogging because we celebrate now that by his stripes we are healed. And we celebrate that because of the cross that our sins can be covered by the blood that he was our uh, executed on our behalf. And it becomes a good thing. In fact, here's what Jesus said in John 16, that he will turn our sorrow into joy and that our joy no one will be able to take away from us. Praise God. And that's what the resurrection is all about, is that he has turned sorrow into joy and no one can turn take our, 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 our joy away from us because Jesus Christ has overcome death, hell, and the grave. He has settled it once and for all. Uh, that's what Hebrews 12, 2 says, that for the joy that was set before me endured the cross. And then he goes on to say, and he has sat down the, the, the throne of God, the right hand of the throne of God, sitting down, uh, scripturally, it's symbolic, symbolic for things being completed, being finished. And the Bible is letting us know he finished the work. He didn't just start the work, he finished it. On that Friday, it was in process, that Saturday. But when he resurrected from the dead, he finished that work. And so as a result, we glory in the cross, we celebrate, we sing songs about the blood of Jesus Christ and the cross because it is our hope, it is our strength. We know that Jesus Christ went to the cross on our behalf and we all have hope now as a result. I think it's fitting. I, I do want to share what I, one other point I shared on Friday night is that on April the 5th, meet the press. Our U.S. Surgeon General Jerome Adams said that this week would be our Pearl Harbor moment during this crisis, this pandemic. He said it would be our 9-11 moment. That's going to be one of the hardest weeks for many. And the individual interviewing Chris Wallace said, how fitting that in Christianity's Holy Week, this would be the hardest week. Because when we look back at history, what could, should have been the worst day in human history is something that God was able to take bad things and take them and work good out of them. I, I, I praise God today because I believe that's what God is going to do with this bad time in our history. He is going to take this and work it for good, for revival, that many souls will be saved. I believe that we're going to say 2020 was a good year. I, I don't know how it's all going to happen right now. If you judge the year based on where we're at right now, you'd have to say this is a sad year or a bad year. 
But I have seen God time and time again do so many things that when we look back, what seemed bad is, is good. We consider good. I believe for those of, uh, who have come through sickness, those who have come through the hospital, that you're already thanking God and praising God. And you have a new appreciation and a, a new illumination to how great our God is. That right now, as I am speaking this message, I believe there are hands that are going up in, in uh, living rooms and kitchens and possibly in hospital rooms and people celebrate saying, God, I see you more as a healer and a miracle worker today than I ever have before because what you have done during this time. And we're going to look back on December 31st, our watch night service, and we are going to celebrate. I think there's going to be a little bit of dancing and shouting going on as we look back and see what God has done over these months. Amen. Anybody going to join with me in agreement? If so, can I hear an amen? Because amen means truly, verily, we are united in that. This is why even going back in history, we've sung songs about it's going to be worth it all. Every heartache, every trial, every mile, it's going to be worth it all when we see Jesus, when we come through on the other side. And so this today, we celebrate the resurrection that changed everything. It's the linchpin of Christianity. It makes all of the difference in the world. It gives us hope, even in times of mourning. Today, when we think about Sister Laura Darby, we, we, we weep with those that we, we, we miss her, but we rejoice because of the resurrection, because we know that Ralph and Laura Darby are going to be reunited, and we are going to be reunited with them one day in the air. And so I, I celebrate the gospel. And today, in particular, in alignment with our theme and in light of our messages on Palm Sunday and, and Good Friday, here's what I want to, to focus on for the rest of our time together. I want to encourage you to keep following Jesus. That's right. Keep following Jesus. Remember, our, the theme of our Easter campaign is Jesus saying that if we want to be his disciples, we must deny ourselves take up our cross, and follow Jesus. I'm saying deny yourself, take up your cross, follow Jesus, and keep following Jesus. You're saying, what, what do you mean by that? Today, I want to encourage you to follow Jesus beyond the cross. I want to continue beyond the cross. Deny yourselves, take up your cross, follow Jesus, go to the cross. Uh, remember, the crucifixion is about death. It's about repentance. Repentance is when we die out to ourselves, when we deny ourselves, when we crucify our flesh with its passions and desires. Galatians 5.24 says this, And those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Paul is making it very personal to go along with our theme of let it start with me. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. And so when we talk about Jesus going to the cross, he went in our place physically. He shed his blood to atone or cover for our sins. But sin still requires that we die. It requires the second cross. Not only the cross that Jesus died on, but that we take up our cross and we die. It requires us to death die. And that's what repentance is all about, taking up our cross, denying ourselves, dying out to our flesh, its passions and desires, the things that Paul talked about. And so this is what we celebrate today. But I want you to go and, and continue to follow Jesus beyond the cross. Because beyond the cross is baptism. Beyond the cross, Jesus was buried. And the Bible lets us know that we are buried with him in baptism. Romans 6, 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. Colossians 2, 12. Buried with him in baptism. Of course, you only bury the dead. Those who have truly, in, in the kingdom, truly repented. And, and repentance, let, let me just break repentance down even a little bit more. Repentance is a combination of two things. It's a combination of confessing our sins and that we are sinners. And it's the second part, which is, I think, the toughest part. It's committing the rest of our lives to being followers of Jesus Christ, submitting to his word, his will, his way. It is that complete surrender, dying out to ourselves to live in him. And so when we deny ourselves and take up our cross, that's what repentance is all about. But you have to go keep following Jesus beyond the cross. And after the cross, he was buried. 
and we are called to be buried. And our burial is not physically, just like our dying is not physically. Our dying is repentance. Our burial is found in baptism. In the Old Testament, uh, a part of entering into covenant with Yahweh was circumcision. And in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ is a part of entering into the New Covenant. Colossians, Paul focuses in on this, Colossians 2.11. In him you are also circumcised with the circumcision made with hand, without hands. He's saying that we enter in covenant just like they did, but in the Old Testament it was circumcision. Our circumcision is made without hands. He goes on to say, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism. Paul is saying that our burial is in baptism just as his burial was in a tomb. And so today I challenge you to, yes, take up your cross and follow Jesus, but keep following him beyond the cross, following him to the tomb, follow him to the grave, that if you are died, you need to be buried. If you have uh, put your flesh and crucified it, you need to be buried with him in baptism in his name. Paul says that that's what is the circumcision or the way we enter into this new covenant. He would go on to say that he has forgiven all trespasses. He wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. He disarmed principalities, powers, and made a spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Paul is saying that we, we are buried, we are buried with Jesus Christ. That, that's why we are baptized in the name of Jesus. Acts 4.12 says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Why is it in Jesus' name? Because Jesus is the one who went to the cross, and Jesus is the one who beyond the cross was buried. And Paul is saying we need to go to the cross and die into our sins and our flesh, its passions and desires, but we need to go beyond the cross and keep following Jesus, and we need to be buried with him. And we're buried with him in baptism. And his name, the one who died for us, is called over our life, confessed, professed over our life. Acts 2.21 says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so in Acts 2.38, the Bible says, When they asked, What shall we do? Peter says, Repent, die, crucify your flesh. Crucify your flesh with its passions and desires. And then he goes on, Peter says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Uh, throughout the first century, throughout the book of Acts, Acts 2, 8, 10, 19, they baptized people in the name of Jesus. And it is more than an outward symbol of, of what's taking place with the uh, in, in an inward work. It, it, it's more than that. Paul says that we are baptized and that it is dealing with the handwriting of ordinances that is against us. He says that, that he is blotting out our past. He's blotting out our, our, our history. And that we have a clean slate. That all of the charges against us have been canceled. Why? Because his blood is applied to our life in baptism. Praise God. Realize, that's why I want to follow Jesus beyond the cross. Yes, I want to deny myself and take up my cross and follow him, but I want to follow him beyond the cross. I want to be baptized in his name, where the remission, the removal, the cleansing of my sins, where his blood is applied to me, where my slate is clean and I have a new life. Isaiah says it like this in Isaiah 118, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be white as wool. Is anybody thankful that in baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, that the slate was clean, the handwriting, the charges against us were, were removed and blotted out and covered with the blood of Jesus Christ, and we are declared just and righteous because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so I challenge you today, keep following. If last week you repented of your sins, if last week you decided to nail your passions and your desires to the cross and to, to die with him, keep following him and be buried with him as well. And so it's critical that we keep following Jesus, that we don't stop at the cross, 
that we need to follow him to the grave. And most of all, for today, we need to continue to follow him beyond the grave until a new resurrection. We have to keep following Jesus. Uh, Paul was stating that, that more than follow him to the grave or to baptism, the burial, that we also need to realize that Jesus Christ arose from the dead, that he overcame death, hell, and the grave. Uh, Romans 6, 4, Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. We, we talked about that before, but I didn't give you the full scripture. Here's how it finishes. That just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Does that sound good to anybody? Paul is saying that beyond the grave, we should resurrect and we should walk into a new new life. I am for that. Colossians 2.12 says, Bury with him in baptism. You also raise with him through faith and the work of God who raised him from the dead. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The infilling of the Holy Spirit is the new birth, the new life that God has intended for all of us who are following him. For all of us who followed him to the cross and followed him to the tomb, he also wants us to follow him to a resurrection. Remember going back to Acts 2.38 when they asked what they should do, Peter says, repent, die, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, be buried, be, get a clean slate, let him cover your sins in burial. And then he says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You shall receive the gift of his spirit in you. Remember, Jesus came. The purpose of his coming, John 10.10, 10, is that we might have life and we might have life more abundantly. The living water of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit, is what he proclaimed life to the woman at the well in Samaria. Jesus wanted everyone to continue in, in following him and in their experiencing of a resurrection. In, in his conversation with Nicodemus in, in uh, John 3, he told Nicodemus, you must be born again of water and of the Spirit, and that this is a new birth, a new life to be born again. It's not enough just to deny yourself to take up your cross and follow him. You need to follow him to baptism, and then you need to follow him to a resurrection from the dead where you can walk in newness of life. If you have never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, filled with the Spirit of God, speaking initially in a language you do not understand, and additionally, producing the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Can I tell you one thing? Please keep following Jesus. Don't stop. Don't stop at repentance. Don't stop at baptism. Follow him to the resurrection. Let a resurrection take place in your life. Matthew 24, 13 says that he who endures to the end shall be saved. We have to keep following him all the way to the end. Remember the word that the angels spoke in Acts 1? Acts 1 verses 9 through 11 says this, Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward uh, the heaven, behold, two men had stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into the heaven? This same Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into the heaven. The church has always realized that Jesus was taken up in the cloud, taken up in the clouds, and we've always been looking for him to return in the clouds as well. We've sung about it, we talk about it, that, that as he was taken in the clouds, he's going to return. Paul says it like this in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. We who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. You know what Paul is saying? You know what the angels were saying, the church has been saying, is that Jesus is coming back. And those who keep following him, those who are faithful, those who are endure to the end, shall be saved. Because Jesus is coming back for those who are faithful. 
We are to always follow the Lord beyond repentance, beyond baptism, beyond receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. We are to endure to the same. And, and this, Paul is addressing Timothy about, uh, in 2 Timothy 4, 6, I am being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul was encouraging Timothy to keep following Jesus, to finish the race. Paul is saying, I, I, I'm coming to the end. I'm finishing the race. I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. And as a result, there is a crown of righteousness. I'm doing the right thing. And I'm going to receive my reward for enduring to the end. And Timothy, I want you to do the same thing. Keep following Jesus. And he says, because this reward, this enduring to this end, this salvation, heaven, the new heaven and the new earth is for everybody who will keep on following him until he appears again. In fact, it would be two verses later that Paul would present the alternative to Timothy. He would say that in 2 Timothy 4.10 that Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Now notice a few things you need to know about Demas. Demas denied himself. He took up the cross and followed Jesus. Demas went to the watery grave of baptism. Demas was filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. A resurrection took place in his life. He followed Jesus through repentance and baptism and being filled with the Holy Ghost, yet he did not endure to the end. There came a time when Demas forsook the church. He was no longer faithful because he loved this present world. And Paul is saying this, keep following Jesus all the way to the end. That's why we celebrate the passing of Sister Laura Darby and Ralph and Laura Darby. Not, not that they denied themselves, took up the cross and followed them. Oh, we celebrate every new birth that takes place. Their baptism, them being filled with the Holy Ghost. But if they had started and not continued to follow Jesus Christ, it would be a tragedy. But we celebrate it because they continue to follow Jesus all the way to the end. And we know that when Sister Darby finished her course and kept the faith, we know that we don't grieve and like those who have no hope. That's what Paul is saying, 1 Thessalonians 4. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Uh, Paul is, he, he's not saying that, that people in the church die. He's saying they fall asleep. They're, they're just going to wake up in a bit. Lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus Paul is saying that when you understand Resurrection Sunday, we, when you understand Easter is all about, you realize that, that we have hope even, even at death in this land because we know that, that they're just sleeping, that because of the resurrection and life that is in them when they were filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Bible says that the Lord is going to quicken that spirit that if that same spirit dwells in us that dwelt in Jesus Christ, just as his body was resurrected, this mortal body will be resurrected. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? We have victory in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Praise God. I, uh, as I come to conclusion today, uh, I, I hope that uh, you've been able to understand what I'm saying. I, I, I've been excited as I as I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, because it is our hope that regardless of the pandemic or the virus or what's happening in the world, we, we have hope today, and it's in Jesus Christ and the resurrection. If this is our 9-11 moment, if this is our Pearl Harbor during this pandemic crisis, can I tell you, we can celebrate and the world cannot take our joy on this day because we know that even death itself is not the final word for the Christian. For those who have followed Jesus in baptism and, and, and being filled with the Spirit, we just go to sleep because resurrection is coming. And so in conclusion, I, I want to uh, reiterate our theme about taking up my cross and following Jesus. I want to make sure I take up my cross, my, I deny myself, take up my cross and follow Jesus. I want to make sure that I repent, that, that I confess to my sins and my fallen condition, and that I commit my life 
the rest of my life to serving Jesus Christ. If you have not done that, do that today. But if you have done that, don't stop there. Keep following him. If you have not been baptized in Jesus' name, calling on the name of Jesus, the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If we, you have not been buried, which is to be immersed, to be plunged underwater, as we call on the name of Jesus, you need to contact us because this has to take place. You can't just follow Jesus to repentance. You also have to follow him to the grave, the watery grave of baptism. And you need to contact us. That needs to take place. And if you've repented and you've been baptized in Jesus' name, don't stop there. You need to follow him to the resurrection. You need to receive the Holy Ghost with the initial evidence, the initial experience of speaking in an unknown tongue. And if you have done that, please, please don't stop. Keep following him. Endure to the end. As Hebrews says it like this, Hebrews 12. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Run with endurance the race that is set before us, because there is joy ahead. Jesus is coming back. And if we have repented and been baptized and filled with his spirit, and if we endure as disciples to the end, we know that when he comes back, he's coming for us. And so let me encourage you with the writer of Hebrews, lay aside every weight and sin. Run with endurance. Look forward to the joy that is waiting for us and finish this race. Because Revelations 21.4, God will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he, said, he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. This is what we're looking forward to. That while we grieve today and we sorrow today with losses like Sister Laura Darby or others who might go to meet the Lord, one day we are looking forward with joy because we know that those who are asleep in Christ will awake and those who are living for Christ will be raptured together. And we will forever be with the Lord. And there will be no heartache and no pain because that's what resurrection procures for us today. And so ladies and gentlemen, wherever you're at, keep following Jesus. If this is the first time you've heard the gospel, deny yourself and repent and commit and confess. If, the, if not, you're somewhere on that journey, be baptized in his name, be filled with his spirit, and endure to the end. Be faithful to what God has for us. Thank you. I, I want to pray right now. I feel the presence of God in such a powerful way because the gospel is power. It, uh, Paul says it like this in Romans 1 and 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God to salvation, and we celebrate that power today. Lord, I thank you for this Resurrection Sunday, for Easter Sunday. I thank you that uh, I'm speaking to people who have denied themselves. They've taken up the cross and followed you. They've, been, they, they've repented. They've confessed their sins. They've committed their lives to you. Many have followed you beyond the cross to the grave. and They were baptized in your name. Lord, they, they allowed your, your blood to be applied to their lives as they were spiritually circumcised and entered into this new covenant. And I'm thankful that they didn't stop there, that they were filled with your spirit, speaking in a language they did not understand as your spirit gave the words and that they continued to allow your spirit to produce fruit in their life, that they were uh, fulfilled Acts 2.38. They repented, they were baptized in your name and filled with your spirit. But Lord, help us to continue to follow you, to keep following you, even beyond being filled with your spirit, beyond the resurrection, all the way until the end, that we would endure to the end, that we would be saved. Oh God, I don't want anyone on the other side of my voice to have the testimony like Demas did, that somewhere along the line that they, they forsook because they loved this present world. But I want to pray that everyone I'm speaking to today, that we would endure to the end, that, that when that resurrection takes place, when those sleeping come to wake and we are all brought together to meet you in the air, that we are joined together with, with our elders of old, with generations of, ago of the saints of God, 
and that the body of Christ is reunited. That is our hope today. That is the promise of the resurrection. And we thank you for it today. In Jesus' name. First Apostolic Church, on this first Sunday in the history of the United States where Christian churches are not getting together, can I tell you we have just as much hope as they had at the very first resurrection. And I cannot wait till we get together to celebrate what God is doing. I cannot wait till we see in person those who we have been praying for and we can celebrate the miracles and the healings and the wonders. But until that day takes place, remember this, keep following, keep following, endure, be faithful. Because one day we want to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful service. I love you very much. It is such a privilege to be the lead pastor here at First Apostolic Church and for us to be family as well as an army together that God is raising up to fulfill his mission. Continue to be faithful. We look forward to seeing you on Wednesday night at Bible study and our devotions throughout this week. And when we assemble together at 1690 Sheffield Road in a few weeks. But keep on, keep the faith, endure. Amen. Keep following Jesus Christ. God bless you.